You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi everybody and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, but he swords. Those little bits of history that don't quite fit in anywhere else. With me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. Spooky season is almost upon us, and you know what that means? Pumpkins are everywhere. Like, every time I see any of that family of vegetables, they're vegetables. Wait, are they fruit? Are pumpkins fruit? Because their seeds are on the inside. So that, that makes them fruit right so over the last few years i've gotten into the habit of saying oh my god like because who doesn't love seasonal puns thank you very much i think last year i was very much into the kaiser chiefs and i was like oh my god i can't believe it i've never been this far away from home and similar but not the same um, it's been Marina and the Diamonds. Oh my god. Because uh, I thought that was funny. Because I think I'm funny. Nobody else has to. That's fine. But anyway, I wanted to do something a little bit more fun and less depressing than our last episode. Because we're getting into spooky season and that means I'm going to be talking about the creepy, dark... Violent, awful, horrific, disastrous history. Lots of witches. Very much into the witches this year. And, surprisingly enough, not the happiest of tales. And as such, it's going to be a thing. I thought we'll do something a little bit lighter. And I thought what would be more fun than leaning into the stereotype of Ireland and the island that didn't have sex. Or... The Island That Despised Doing It, which is my favourite title. I just... Wow. I remember reading about this back when I was looking up. I did this series called 32 Counties in 32 Days, Irish History in 60 Seconds or Less. Because there are 32 counties in Ireland. And as such, I wanted to do a piece of history on each one over 32 days. Which... It literally took me, I think, two months to gather all the information for 32 counties because some counties did not have a lot happen in them and then some had too much and then I had to choose what I was going to talk about. But anyway, and I remember reading about this island because it was something to do with a weird Easter tradition somewhere which led me into this rabbit hole which trickled down, trickled down, trickled down. I end up here, Inishbug. Now, a lot of our information comes from John and Betty Messenger, who were anthropologists who visited the island in the 60s. Now, a lot of the stuff regarding, um, that was produced regarding this island, it has John C. Messenger's name on it, but doesn't have Betty's. Why are we fucking surprised? Like, she was there. She did a lot of the fucking work too, mate. Like, she was also an anthropologist. It's not just you, John. Sit down. So while the rest of the world was getting into the swinging 60s, Inishbug was not. The messengers had moved to Inishbug in order to conduct some ethnographic research. Between 1958 and 1966. So, eight years. And they came to the conclusion that this devout Catholic island off the coast of Galway was one of the most sexually repressed slash sexually naive places in the world. So shocking was this discovery that when John Messenger released his book, he had renamed the island so as to not embarrass the people and ensure their anonymity and their privacy. He had renamed it Inish Bug. The island's real name is Inish here, which means Easterly Ireland because it's like the most eastern island, I think, off the coast of Galway. 
off the coast of Connemara. That was a fucking atrocious accent. I've lived in Ireland most of my life and I cannot do an Irish accent. Maybe like a Colchie Donegal farmer person. Because that's kind of how my accent swings sometimes. I just kind of naturally fall into that sort of vein. But yeah. So they wanted to protect the island's privacy. So much so that in the book it included a detailed history, directions, local landmarks, and also a fucking map. A map of the island. Oh sure, yeah, no one's going to know what it is when we give them directions and fucking longitude and latitude. What? Why give them a pseudonym at all? What was the fucking point of it? Ooh, look, we care about people. We're protecting their identities. This is where they fucking live. What? what? Oh, anyway, the audacity of men. Um, Why are you complaining about him and not complaining about Betty? Because his name's on the fucking book, not hers. You know what? He wants to put his name on the book. He, he gets the brunt of my aggression. That's how it works. The people who called this island home were descended from those who had escaped Cromwellian, I'm going to call it dictatorship, because he was an absolute candlestick. So they fled British persecution and escaped to this fucking island, practically cut off from the rest of the world. You know what? Some of you have probably seen Inishir, but not realised you've seen Inishir. Because if you've seen the opening credits of Father Ted, there's like a, an old steamer that's like shipwrecked or washed up on the shore of an island. That's in a shear. But anyway, on this island, the messenger soon discovered that sex education was non-existent. It didn't, it didn't exist. But this is 1960s Ireland, so at the best of times, there isn't any sex education. Like, everything is ruled by the church. It's just how it was, you know? Because sex, sexuality and being ashamed of that is one of the most effective ways to make people subscribe to a religion. Because sex and sexuality and sexual interest for most people it's very natural and it's it's fun and well it should be fun it should be enjoyable it should be pleasurable and by making people feel bad about it you create this split in them and they become to see or they begin to see and they begin to see their very nature their very own ways of being as sinful and dirty and bad and just plain wrong which then causes them to become more reliant on your religion your church for their salvation on what is or what should be inherently natural typical and what is a very healthy way to be it's it's kind of really clever when you think about it, that it's a way of subjugating and controlling people by telling them to go against their innate ways of being. And it sidebar, I know I've just sidebarred, but sidebar again, is that somebody gave me a two star review because I rambled and now I'm like, yeah, you'd fucking hate this episode then, wouldn't you? <laughs> but back to Inishir. So because, you know, the repressive Ireland, especially a remote island in the 60s, wasn't exactly the most um, progressive of areas, that after interviewing all 350 inhabitants of the island, or I assume 350 adult inhabitants of the island, I don't believe they question children about sexual habits because that, that'd be fucking creepy, right? Ew. And they discovered out of everybody there, only three mothers had told their daughters what to expect on their wedding night. Like, 
young women got married and didn't know what sex was. They didn't know that they were going to have sex. They didn't know to expect sex. They didn't know what sex was. They didn't know about P's going in V's. None of that stuff. Like, what? And when they were asked why they didn't feel the need to pass on this information to their daughters, they were told that it was better to let nature take its course. Jesus fucking Christ, women. If something is indeed so natural, fucking tell them. Tell them. But it wasn't just sexual intercourse that they had failed to inform them of. They knew nothing, most young women knew nothing about periods, menstruation. So much so that many young women were fucking traumatised by their first period because they just thought they were bleeding. They thought they were hemorrhaging, that something bad was happening to them. They were in pain and blood is coming out of them. They did not know what was going on. So girls and women would get their first period and no one would explain to them what it was because many couldn't explain it. Like, there was such a shame over the female body and what it does that a lot of women were unintentionally ignorant. Like, they could not explain to their daughters what was happening. They didn't have that information. So, when Betty Messenger was there, many of the women were asking her questions regarding menstruation and the physiological, the physical processes that go along with that. They were far more interested in having that information about knowing their own bodies than they were interested in talking about sex. Like The majority of the questions asked were to do with the menstrual cycle and everything that pertains to that as opposed to shagging. But like, what they knew about periods? Fuck me, they knew even less about the menopause. Like, islanders generally believed that the menopause would just make women mentally ill. Like, they would go cocoa bananas up in cloud cuckoo. And it was pretty common that once women hit menopause, they would just stop. Like, they would hit their 40s and just remove themselves from public life like they wouldn't go to any of like the church meetings they wouldn't go and speak to their friends go to the shops none of that or the i'm assuming there was a shop where they would get flour and things right like i feel like something but yeah they'd start the menopause and then they would just hide the fuck away with many and i shit you not with many of them just confining themselves to bed until they died. Like, they would just stay hidden away from everybody until they died. Oh, oh, they, they died of old age. They didn't just, like, crawl into a bed and then wait for death. So back to sex. The island elders, they claimed that there was no premarital sex, no extramarital sex, None of that was happening on the island. Everybody was good. And when the messenger started asking around, they discovered that sexual intercourse in the missionary position was like the only thing regarding sex that the islanders knew, the ones that did know. And no other sexual act was considered. Like, they were truly shocked they were fucking surprised and bewildered and confuddled and aghast that anything out with this existed. They had no concept of heavy petting. Well, um, manually masturbating women anyway. Male masturbation, they were aware of that. Now, heavy petting, oral sex, anal sex, nah blew their minds at the very concept of this existed. The only sexual acts officially reported on the island were men wanking and heterosexual shagging in the missionary position. No foreplay, not even a little bit. 
Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes, even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera, but this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. Sex was always initiated by the husband. Like, didn't matter, husband was always the man who initiated sex. And it was always fairly quick. There was, again, no foreplay. And it was always in the missionary position, under the sheets, and still wearing their night clothes. I mean, this is the time where people were wearing, uh, they were still wearing night shirts. So it would have been a wee guinea, as I would call it, a wee guinea, a wee nightgown. Think Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, when he comes out and his wee caps on and he's got his wee guinea on. Because, like, pyjamas weren't really a thing until World War II, when it was seen as unseemly to be running to a shelter in your wee guinea. So pyjamas came about. So this is pre-pyjamas. So they were still in their night clothes. Like, they were still dressed having sex. I mean, you know, I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum, but they had no yum in this. For women, sex wasn't enjoyable. It wasn't to be enjoyed it was to be endured. And like today, men had no concept of the female orgasm. And frankly, quite a lot of men nowadays don't seem to be able to grasp that either. But yeah, on in this year, nobody knew what a female orgasm was. Like, they didn't know it could happen. Like, there's this middle-aged fella, and he is a bachelor, He's the bachelor of the island, and he is known for shagging tourists. So, lady tourists would come across the island to look at the lovely Inishir, and he would woo them with his rugged, country, rural, islandy ways. And he was uh, pretty proud of himself. He saw himself as quite the cad, and as, you know, a Casanova of sorts. And he felt that he really was wise in the ways of the world. But he wasn't that wise. Because he was chatting to John Messenger. And he asked him, this weird thing happened to this woman when we were having sex. Like, she had these violent bodily convulsions. And she was making strange noises. And Messenger's like, she had an orgasm. And this fella was absolutely fucking shocked because he had absolutely zero clue that women could also climax. He didn't know that was a thing and he was incredibly surprised to find that out. But it wasn't just people who were incredibly repressed on this island. They conditioned their animals into it too. Like if a dog licked itself. You know, as they do, they're always licking at their ghoulies. Whenever they did that, they would get beaten. Like, people would beat their dogs for licking their bits. Now, they were cleaning. Isn't that a cleaning thing? I feel like it's a cleaning thing. Jesus Christ, what would they do if they saw a cat? Can you imagine them, like, trying to deal with a cat licking its entire body? They'd freak the fuck out. Because it wasn't just, like, sexuality and stuff like that that bothered them. 
they were also really freaked out by being in the nip. Like, being naked wasn't an option. They were like Tobias Fumke. Like, Fumke. Fumke? Fumke? Him. You know him. And he is a never nude. And they were, you know, the loving embodiment of this, this thing. So, the only people that ever got naked were babies and infants. So, they would be bathed once a week in the absolute nip. And I'm not sure at what point they would stop being bathed and, you know, naked. I think it would be once they're big enough to wash themselves. I feel like that'll be it, you know. So, children, adults, the elderly, they would wash their hands and their faces which is good, you want to have clean hands. They would wash their necks, their feet, and their lower legs. Like, they wouldn't wash the thighs, they wouldn't wash the tummy, the bum, the chest. How did they wipe their arses? Did they just, like, never wipe? Because that feels like... I mean, everybody had to pee sitting down. They had to. I feel like they would try and avoid touching as much as possible. So everybody had to pee sitting down, right? Right. So, because they were so, I don't know, terrified of being naked, a lot of the times when they were getting dressed out of their nightwear into their daywear, they would do it, like, under the sheets. Like, in the bed, they would get changed so that they could not be seen, like, by their, like, siblings, like, husbands, wives, all of it, like, they would just, they would just do that. Now, some women on the island did, uh, they did say that they had bathed in the rock pools off the island. And for a hot minute, the messengers thought these women might be, you know, the rule breakers. They might be going against the grain. Were they skinny dipping? They were not. They were wading up to their ankles, stealthily dressed. They were in the water, up to ankles, clothes on, and all alone. Like they did it, they were isolated, you know? They didn't do it near anybody else, in case anybody saw their ankles, I guess. But yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't what they were expecting at all. It was wild. Speaking of being in the water, because they were never nudes, effectively, they wouldn't take off their clothes to learn to swim. Now, I don't know if you've ever been or lived on an island, but it is recommended that when you live near large bodies of water, that you should probably learn to, you know, not die in it. Just, just as a precaution, at least learn to fucking float. But yeah, no one on this island could swim. Not even the fishermen. So, at this point, the main sort of, the mainstay of the island was crafting and fishing and farming. Like, it was very, very traditional. And the fishermen couldn't fucking swim. So if anything happened to them, anything happened to their boat, they were fucked, effectively. They were going down like a sack of spuds. Mm -mm. But the fishermen told the couple that they didn't need to learn to swim because they were such good fishermen. Like, they were on their boats like nobody's business. So they never actually needed to learn because it was never going to be a problem. But another issue that comes with never allowing yourself to be naked or have someone view your body, that when they were ill or there was an issue or a problem, they weren't able to check it and get it cured or remedied within, you know, a, a, a workable time frame. Like, there was this nurse that used to come over from, like, mainland Ireland and would come to the island to, you know, just check people out, treat them, do all the, the necessary medical stuff. And 
she couldn't do her job because people would not want her to examine them. They didn't want to have to take off their clothes. They didn't want to be physically examined. And that by the time they actually went to her when it was so bad that they were desperate for treatment, when they were willing to forego everything that had been conditioned in them and allow her to examine them, it was too late. Like, the stuff, the condition, the illness had progressed to a point where nothing could really be done. The chokehold that Christianity and the Catholic Church had on this population, it created stigma and trauma and isolation and mental and emotional damage, physical damage. People died because they couldn't get the treatment they needed because they were too worried. Their hygiene levels must have been awful. Like, again, the whole not being able to wipe thing, it's not good. Like, women wouldn't know to pee after sex. They probably got UTIs all the fucking time. Like, they didn't know anything. And a lot of it stems from the fact that this community was so insular. Like, it didn't have a key, the ferry couldn't come in, so it was very much cut off from the majority of, like, the mainland of the world. Like, if you wanted to visit the island during this time, your ship had to anchor off the coast, and then canoes would take you from your ship to the island. But then when the ferry link started, the island was no longer isolated. They had radios and television, and I think it was 1997 that the full island had electricity. Like, it wasn't all over, it was only bits of it that had it first. And the island changed with the times. Like, it's no longer like a sexually repressed, you know, area. But it still very much champions like traditional Irish culture and heritage. It's a big tourist spot for crack of kyol and all of the fun stuff that comes with traditional Irishness. Like, I think they still have one of the oldest forms of Irish, I think, is there. I think they still speak old Irish there. That's actually something my papa called it, like, the Irish that I learned growing up, was he would call it Old Irish, like the Ulster dialect. And he would refer to anything out with that as Book Irish, because I think the books are all like printed in like Carrier Cork, and he'd be like, "Ah, sure, that's that book Irish, exasta, exasta, it's a gibberish." But yes, that is the story of Inish Bug, or Inish Year, the island that despised doing it. If you liked my retelling of this weird piece of Irish history, feel free to rate and review five stars. You can follow me on. Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And I do have a YouTube, but there is nothing on it yet. I am Who Did What Now Pod everywhere, apart from Twitter, where I am Who Did What Now PD. Links are in the description down below. You may also find my personal Twitter under History Harlot, so I'm there too. Tweet me, I'll respond. And yeah, I think that's it for today. And with that, I shall bid you good night. Adios, au revoir, au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.